Chapter 6, Part 1 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Training of the Aviator, Part 1. The Great War, opening in Europe in 1914, and before its end, involving practically the whole world, including our own nation, has had more to do with the rapid development of aircraft, both dirigible balloons and airplanes, than any other agency up to the present time. It tested widely and discarded all but the most efficient. It established the relative value of the dirigible and the airplane, so relegating the former to the rear that it is said that the death of Count Zeppelin, March 8, 1917, was in a measure due to his chagrin and disappointment. It stimulated at once the inventiveness of the constructors and the skill and daring of the pilots. When it opened, there were a few thousand machines and trained pilots in all the armies of Europe. Before the war had been in progress three years, there were more flying men over the battlefields of the three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, than there were at that time soldiers of all classes enlisted in the regular army of the United States. Before that war, the three arms of the armed service had been infantry, artillery, and cavalry. The experience of war added a new arm the Aviation Corps, and there is today some doubt whether in importance it should not be ranked above the cavalry. When war was declared, none of the belligerent nations had its aerial fleet properly organized, nor was the Aviation Department in any of them equal in preparedness to the rest of the Army. The two great antagonists did not differ greatly in the strength of their flying forces. Germany possessed about 1,000 airplanes exclusive of about 450 in private hands, of all which it is estimated about 700 were ready for immediate service. Fourteen Zeppelins were in commission, and other large dirigibles of different types brought the number of the craft of this sort available up to 40. France was stronger in airplanes, but weaker in dirigibles. Of the former, she had about 1,500, of the latter not more than 25. The land was swept for planes in the hands of private owners, and, as the French people had from the first taken a lively interest in aviation, more than 500 were thus obtained. The French, furthermore, at the very outset, imperiled their immediate strength in the air for the sake of the future by adopting four or five machines as army types and throwing out all of the other makes. More than 550 machines were thus discarded, and their services lost during the first weeks of the war. The reason for this action was the determination of the French to equip their aviation corps with standardized machines of a few types only. Thus, interchangeable parts could always be kept in readiness in case of an emergency, and the aviation corps was obligated to familiarize itself with the workings of only a few machines. The objection to the system is the fact that it practically stopped all development of any machines in France except the favored few. Moreover, it threw out of the service, at a stroke, or remanded for future instruction, not less than 400 pilots who had been trained on the rejected machines. The order was received with great public dissatisfaction, and for a time threatened serious trouble in the Chamber of Deputies, where criticisms of the direction of the flying service even menaced the continuance of the ministry in power. At the outset of the war, Great Britain lagged far behind the other chief belligerents in the extent of her preparations for war in the air. As has been pointed out, the people of that nation had never taken the general interest in aviation which was manifested in France, and there was no persistent Count von Zeppelin to stir government and citizens into action. The situation was rather anomalous. Protected from invasion by its ring of surrounding waters, England had long concentrated its defensive efforts upon its navy. But while the danger of invasion by the air was second only to that by sea, the British contemplated with indifference the feverish building of zeppelins by Germany and the multiplication of aircraft of every sort in all the nations of the continent. The manufacture of aircraft was left to private builders, and not until the war was well under way did the government undertake its systematic supervision. The Royal Aerial Factory, then established, became the chief manufacturer of machines for Army and Navy use, and acted also as the agent for the inspection and testing of machines built by private firms. Control of the Royal Flying Corps is vested in the Admiralty, the government holding that strategy of airships was distinctly naval. 
In the use of seaplanes, the British were early far in the lead of other nations, as we shall see in a later chapter, and in the prompt and efficient employment of such aircraft as she possessed at the opening of the war, she far outclassed Germany, which in point of numbers was her superior. At that moment, Great Britain possessed about 500 machines, of which 200 were seaplanes and 15 dirigibles. Despite this puny force, however, British aviators flew across the Channel in such numbers to the headquarters in France that when the Expeditionary Army arrived on the scene, it found ready to its hand a scouting force vastly superior to anything the Germans could put in the air. It is no exaggeration to say that the Royal Flying Corps saved Sir John French's army in his long and gallant fight against the overwhelming numbers of the foe. Russia, before the war, had hidden her aeronautic activities behind the dreary curtain of miles of steppe and marsh that shut her off from the watchfulness of Western Europe. Professional aviators, indeed, had gone thither to make exhibition flights for enormous purses and had brought back word of huge airplanes in course of construction and an eager public interest in the subject of flying but the secrecy which all the governments so soon to be plunged into war sought to throw about their production of aircraft was especially easy for russia in her isolation when the storm burst her air fleet was not less than eight hundred airplanes and at least twenty-five dirigibles a competent authority estimates that at the outbreak of the war the various powers possessed a total of four thousand nine hundred eighty aircraft of all sorts this sounds like a colossal fleet, but by 1917 it was probably multiplied more than tenfold. Of the increase of aircraft, we can judge only by guesswork. The belligerents keep their output an inviolable secret. It was known that many factories with a capacity of from 30 to 50 planes a week were working in the chief belligerent lands, that the United States was shipping aircraft in parts to avoid violation of neutrality laws before their entrance upon the war, and that American capital operated factories in Canada whence the completed craft could be shipped regardless of such laws. How great was the loss to be offset against this new construction is a subject on which no authoritative figures are available. It was estimated early in the war that the life of an airplane in active service seldom exceeded three weeks. In passing, it may be mentioned that by some misapprehension on the part of the public, this estimate of the duration of a machine was thought to cover also the average life of the aviators in service. Happily, this was far from true. The mortality among the machines was not altogether due to wounds sustained in combat, but largely to general wear and tear rough usage and constant service. The slightest sign of weakness in a machine led to its instant condemnation and destruction, for if it should develop in mid-air into a serious fault, it might cost the life of the aviator and even a serious disaster to the army which he was serving. As the war went on, the period of service of a machine became even briefer for with the growing demand for faster and more quickly controllable machines, everything was sacrificed to lightness and speed. The factor of safety, which early in the war was six to eight, was reduced to three and a half, and instances were known in all services of machines simply collapsing and going to pieces under their own weight without wound or shock. About the extent to which the belligerent governments developed their air forces after the outbreak of war, there was, during the continuance of that conflict, great reticence maintained by all of them. At the outset, there was little employment of the flyers except on scouting reconnaissance work or in directing artillery fire. The raids of zeppelins upon England, of seaplanes on Kiel and Cuxhaven, of airplanes on Friedrichshaven, Essen and Venice came later. It has been noted by military authorities that while Germany was provided at first with the largest aviation force of all the belligerents, she either underestimated its value at the outset or did not know how to employ it, for she blundered into and through Belgium using her traditional Uhlans for scouts, to the virtual exclusion of airmen. The effectiveness of the Belgian fight for delay is ascribed largely to the intelligent and effective use its strategists made of the few aircraft they possessed. Wellington was wont to say that the thing he yearned for most in battle was to see the other side of that hill. Napoleon wrote, Nothing is more contradictory, nothing more bewildering, than the multitude of reports of spies or of officers sent out to reconnoitre. 
some locate army corps where they have seen only detachments others see only detachments where they ought to have seen army corps so the two great protagonists of the opening years of the nineteenth century deplored their military blindness in the opening years of the twentieth it was healed all that wellington strove to see all that the cavalry failed to find for napoleon is today brought to headquarters by airmen neatly set forth in maps supported by photographs of the enemy's positions taken from the sky before describing the exploits of the airmen in actual campaign let us consider some account of how they were trained for their arduous and novel duties to the non-professional an amazing thing about the employment of aircraft in war has been the rapidity with which pilots are trained the average layman would think that to learn the art of maneuvering an airplane with such swiftness as to evade the attacks of an enemy and to detect precisely the proper moment and method of attacking him in turn would require long and arduous practice in the air but as we have seen in earlier chapters inventors like the wrights Blériot and Farman learned to fly with but a few hours spent in the air, with flights lasting less than ten minutes each. So, too, the Army aviators spent but little time aloft, though their course of instruction covered in all a period of about four months. Some account of the method of instruction, as reported by several out of the hundred or more American boys who went to fly for France, may be interesting. As a rule, the aviators were from twenty to twenty-five years of age. Below twenty, boys are too rash. Above twenty-five, they are too prudent, said a sententious French aviator. A slight knowledge of motors, such as would be obtained from familiarity with automobiles, was a marked advantage at the start. For the first task of the novice was to make himself familiar with every type of airplane engine. The army pilot in all the armies was the aristocrat of the service. Mechanics kept his motor in shape and helpers housed, cleaned, and brought forth his machine for action. But while all but the actual piloting and fighting was spared him, there was always the possibility of his making an untimely landing back of the enemy's lines with an engine that would not work. To prepare for such an emergency, he was taught all the intricacies of motor construction so that he might speedily correct any minor fault. In our army, and indeed in all others, applicants for appointment to the Aviation Corps were subjected to scientific tests of their nerves and their mental and physical alertness. How they would react to the sudden explosion of a shell near their ears. How long it took the candidate to respond to a sudden call for action. How swiftly he reacted to a sensation of touch were all tested and measured by delicate electric apparatus. A standard was fixed failing to attain which the applicant was rejected the practical effect might be to determine how long after suddenly discovering a masked machine gun a given candidate would take before taking the action necessary to avoid its fire or how quickly would he pull the lever necessary to guard against a sudden gust of wind to the layman it would appear that problems of this sort could only be solved in the presence of the actual attack but science which enables artillerists to destroy a little village beyond the hills which they never see was able to devise instruments to answer these questions in the quiet of the laboratory one of the best-known flying schools of the french army was at po where on broad level planes were in nineteen seventeen four separate camps for aviators each with its group of hangars for the machines its repair shops, and with a tall wireless tower upstanding in the midst for the daily war news from Paris. On these planes, the Wright brothers had made some of their earliest French flights. A little red barn, which they had made their workshop, was still standing there when more suddenly turned the spot into a flying school, often with as many as 5,000 pupils in attendance. Today, that little red barn, writes Carol Dana Winslow, one of the Americans who went to fly for France, stands as a monument to American stupidity. For when we allowed the Wrights to go abroad to perfect their ideas, instead of aiding them to carry on their work at home, we lost a golden opportunity. Now the United States, which gave to the world the first practical airplane, is at least advanced in this all-important science. Arrival at the school, the Tyro studies the fundamentals of flying in the classroom and on the field for two months before he is allowed to go up to receive, as they express it, his baptême de l'air. He picks motors to pieces and puts them together. 
he learns the principles of airplane construction and can discourse on such topics as the angle of attack of the cellule the incidence of the wings and the carrying power of the tail plane more than any other science aviation has a vocabulary of its own and a peculiarly cosmopolitan one drawn from all tongues but with the french predominating america gave the airplane to france but france has given the science its terminology the maps of the battlefields of this war are the marvels of military science made from the air they show every road and water course each ditch and gully every patch of woodland every farmhouse church or stone wall much of the early work of the aviator is in learning to make such maps both by sketches and by the employment of the camera it is no easy task from an airplane one thousand feet up the earth seems to be all a dead level slight hills gentle elevations offer no contrast to the general plane a road is not easy to tell from a trench all these things the aviator must first learn to see with accuracy and then to depict on his map with precision he must learn furthermore to read the maps of his fellows a task presupposing some knowledge of how they had been made he must learn to fly by a map to recognize objects by the technical signs upon it to estimate his drift before the wind because of which the machine moves sidewise on crab or like a crab as a french phrase it End of The Training of the Aviator, Part 1 Recording by William Tomko